Kate, we want to try to uh, take up what we uh, finished this morning. We only got part way through our message, so I want to try to finish it up. And I think it's uh, really important for us to uh, know some things that are important to know. And I'm glad that God gives us some wonderful things that we can count on. And no matter what happens in this world, we can always count on our God doing the right things for us. And uh, we can always trust him in everything that he's ever said. And uh, so as a result, we can believe him and know that we truly have a wonderful God that loves us and that wants to help us in our daily walk with him. And so here as we get into the scriptures again in 1 John chapter 5, I want to uh, read those verses to us again in the way of a uh, refresher course on what we had this morning in verses 9 through 15. And it's so important again that we understand and know what God uh, has for us. And uh, it makes heaven a little bit more exciting, especially in a time of uncertainty. Uh, we don't know from day to day what's going to happen. Uh, uh, the way things are going right now, it could be that you can wake up tomorrow and your money could be worth nothing. And that's uh, pretty close to that right now. And uh, you can wake up tomorrow and not know where your next meal is coming from. You can wake up tomorrow and have no electricity. Uh, you can wake up tomorrow and have no gas. And uh, we can go down the list and uh, we can get pretty negative real fast, can't with things that are happening in our country. And uh, so as a result, it makes us desire that heavenly country uh, where we can look forward to spending eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ and our loved ones that have gone before us. So this is what it says as we begin reading again. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he hath believed not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that you might believe on the name of the Son of God. And uh, again, uh, how exciting that we can know that Jesus can take care of us for all eternity and that he can take care of all of our sins and that he can take care of, uh, of our punishment that we deserve by taking it upon himself. That ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desire of him. I'm so glad that God listens to our prayers. And uh, I think it's kind of exciting this morning. Uh, Martha basically had nine visitors here. She wasn't expecting them. And uh, as I was back visiting with Rose, uh, she just told me, she said, uh, this is eight of my kids and I got eight more at home. <laughs> well, she didn't say exactly home, but she said she had eight more children. And uh, that, that's a few children to have in this day and age, 16 children. And, uh, but anyhow, as we talked to her, she just said, uh, we got up this morning and Christine said, uh, uh, we need to be going to church, Mom. And uh, they just moved back up from Indy. And so uh, why don't we go to Mark Martha's church? And Martha had been her bus driver for I don't know how many years. So I thought that was exciting because Martha said that she had prayed for him and thought about him so many times, uh, these young people that she'd been picking up for, like I said, for I don't know how many years. And so what exciting to see those prayers answered after so many years and to see them here present in our services and uh, nice looking kids, weren't they? And uh, anyhow, uh, really, really excited about them being here. And so anyhow, all that said, uh, and it's amazing how God takes care of us. And he does so much more for us than we could ever expect. And, and then of course, uh, DJ's testimony of God intervened and kept him from uh, being in Iraq. And again, how many times has God intervened and we were not even aware that he intervened? Uh, how many times were you so close to getting COVID or something else or something worse? And uh, God again intervened and spared you. So I'm so thankful for that. But what I'm trying to say is that we, there's so many things that we can't know that God has done for us. But yet there's enough things that we can know that he did for us that we can be so thankful for. And so, of course, this morning we mentioned about the fact that we have a no soul salvation, that we can know that we're going to heaven. We don't have to worry and go, man, I, I, I hope if I just died now, if I just had that wreck I, and, and had died, I, 
uh, I, I sure hope I would have gone to heaven. I, I'm so glad that you can say, hey, we nearly went to heaven. You know what I'm saying? And we can look at it that way instead of the negative way because God will take care of us. I'm going to heaven because of what God did for me, not because of what I did for God. And again, what could we do to earn the right to go to heaven? And again, then what a slam that would be on Jesus to come from heaven and go through all the agony of the cross, all that was involved with it, if there was some other way to go to heaven. And so, of course, the only way to heaven we know is through Jesus Christ. And so, again, we have a no soul salvation. That's something that you have to worry about. It's just a matter of accepting what God says and believing him. And notice what it says. It said that if we don't believe him, we make him a liar. And uh, folks, God is not a politician. He is not a liar. We can always believe and trust him. And then the, the second point that we shared with you this morning was simply this. You can know about your supplication. And basically, that's referring to you can know that God can take care of you. Uh, we may have to start riding bicycles. We may have to start walking more. They have to start riding scooters and other things that we get to church. Uh, but what I'm saying, God will give us the needs that we have. He'll take care of us and get us here. And I'm so thankful that God's concerned about us. And, uh, and I want to emphasize this again as I did this morning, that we can have a confidence in our God because he does love us completely. And uh, again, when I think of the conditions, God's made it very clear what we need to be saved. But he's made it very clear that we have not because we ask not. And so, again, all these things play into the picture when we talk about we know that God can take care of us. And uh, many of you could give story after story tonight of times that God intervened in your behalf, uh, whether it was in some financial way or it was some health uh, reason that was going on in your life or maybe it was some emotional thing that you were going through. But God was able to supply those needs. And so uh, I appreciate that we can know that God does care for us. So tonight we want to talk to you about, you can know about your security. Uh, Levi here recently, since he's been here, one of the things he's done is he's put cameras around our house and he's put the uh, security lights up in different lanes. And uh, it's kind of interesting, you know, we, we can know who's at the door and we can, I can actually talk to him uh, at the door and other lanes and that's nice. You know, you come to the, this old house and all things, you may find it talking to you, you know. Uh, but anyhow, what I'm trying to say is that it's interesting with that security. And security can cover so many different forms. And, and some of you have to ask, how many of you feel like you have financial security right now? And I don't know if anybody can raise your hand and say, yeah, I think financially we're okay. If anything were to happen, we're covered, okay? Uh, you know, and yet that's something that's pretty important, is it not? And I want to make sure that something happens to you, that your family be taken care of, and we can go on and on. And so financial security is a very real thing. Uh, but then also security concerning your ID. Uh, I remember back, uh, well, it's been a number of years ago now, Chuck Hall was our treasurer. And all of a sudden we found out that we were missing a considerable chunk of money out of our bank account. And of course we started checking it out and we found out somebody had somehow or another tapped into our church account. They were living in Tennessee. And uh, they went ahead and they paid off all sorts of bills and everything. And it amounted to about $4,500 that was, was stolen from us. And what happened is they got our ID number down in Tennessee. And we have a missionary that is down in Tennessee. It happens to be in that little town of Hickson, Tennessee, I think the name of it. And so apparently somebody got there. But the, the police department told me this, that uh, when there's ID theft like this, he said, we only catch one in 700 <laughs> so, man, if I'm going to be a thief, that's the way to go. Uh, don't tell people I told you that was the way to make a living, okay? Uh, but what I'm saying is, uh, that's, that's fine. And, and thank the Lord that uh, basically all the money was paid back to us uh, through the, uh, the credit cards and other things that we had money with. And so thank the Lord that we got back. But boy, somebody stole from our church. I mean, literally. So, and we thought it was secure an account of all things. <laughs> Uh, it's amazing how fast things can change in our life when we think we're secure. And then uh, how many can feel like our country is a very secure place to live right now? And uh, it, it's amazing the things that and other things that are happening and people being mugged and being attacked and being shot in school where you feel like school would be one of the safest places in, 
our country and then people being killed in the womb. Uh, you know, we just go on. So security, there's a lot of places that just seem like we can't be that secure, can we? But I'm glad that God can take care of us and give us the security that we need. So before we go any further in our uh, services tonight, we want to ask God's blessing upon us. And again, it's so good to have Daniel here with us. And would you pray for us, brother? Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to be in your house again, Father. We're so thankful for this church testimony that they've had to the community and the father so thank you for brother Jerry and Martha and his family and all the things that they've done. Father we ask that you would just be here with us tonight. Uh, give Brother Jerry the words to say and help us to, to open our hearts to the word. Father we ask that you would also just Father be with our nation at this time. Lord there are so many things Lord that you know only you can remember and, and Father we Ask that you would just watch over the services tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. As we look in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, this verse says so much about security. And uh, in fact, it's the only verse I want to use tonight on security. And I know there's many other verses that we could. But it says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And so there's four things that jump out at me from that verse. And first of all, I see it's a very positive expression because Paul says this, I know, <laughs> I know whom. Basically saying, I know whom I can trust. And folks, we can trust God. I hate to say this, you can't always trust the preacher, and it's not that I'm trying to do anything dishonest. You can't always trust the missionaries. You can't always trust the uh, church workers, but you can always trust God. You can't trust politicians, and I'm not going to make any exceptions. Well, you can't trust politicians, uh, but we can always trust God. Uh, you can't trust what's going to happen to your finances and other things, but we can trust God. So again, all these things, it's a positive experience that we have. I know who. And folks, I'm so glad that I know Jesus. And I'm so glad that Jesus can and will take care of not just me, but everyone that is trusting him as their Savior. And then I think also this verse indicates past experience. I have believed. And folks, we had testimonies a while ago. And then again, many of your testimonies pointed to the fact that you just trust God, that you believe God, that God's going to take care of the needs in your life, and uh, that you are secure in what he's going to do for you and what he has done for you, because he has taken care of you in the past also. So again, we, we look at that, I have believed. And it says, uh, as we look at the present expectations, I am persuaded. And, and it, just the way he said that, it, it's so determined, I am persuaded. It's like there's no question, there's no doubt, never has been any doubt. I know that God can take care of me. And in interest to the one time Paul was the enemy of Christ and set out to destroy the church. How many Christians did he kill? I don't know. But a number of Christians were killed. And oftentimes Paul would refer to himself as the chiefest of sinners. I mean, that was an interesting statement from a preacher, from a man of God. But folks, there was a time that he was trusting religion. He was trusting his position in, in his church, if you please. And he was trusting his past and all these other things. He was trusting in his Roman citizenship. And we could go on and on, all these things. But he finally, he learned to trust in Jesus. And uh, what a blessing. He ended up writing over half of the New Testament for us. And uh, what a, as we look at what he's done, so much to be thankful for this man and the change that took place. And he was able to say with confidence, I am persuaded, <laughs> I am persuaded that I can trust him no matter what happens, no matter what takes place. So we see his present expectations in the first. And then we see a personal exchange. He said this, I have committed unto him. I mean, in one sense, it's one thing to believe and to trust God and know that God's going to take care of you, and, and we should. But also, he, he took it a step further. He says, I have committed. In other words, whatever I can do for Jesus, I'm ready to do it. And, and not only that, I catch the spirit that I want to do. What can I do for you, Jesus? It's so sad that so many times people look at things and say, folks, we, we need to take a special offering. We don't do that very often here. 
So when you say we need to take a special offering, suddenly uh, everybody has to go to the restroom at one time. <laughs> no, not everyone here in this church, but you know, it's amazing how suddenly people got to leave when they were going to take a special offering or suddenly, oh, I forgot my wallet, I left it at home or something, you know, whatever. And uh, it's amazing how many times people just suddenly don't seem to, uh, you know, I, Preacher, you're talking about making a commitment. You don't know how hard it was for us just to get here to get enough money to have the gas so we could get here. You just don't understand, preacher. Making a commitment means that we're willing to do whatever God wants us to do. And you ready? He may actually expect you to sacrifice every now and then. And you ready? I think we should all be willing to sacrifice for Jesus. I mean... He gave the ultimate sacrifice. He gave himself. Folks, he wasn't dying for his sins. He was dying for your sins. He was taking your punishment upon himself. So, Paul made it clear. Everything I have, I've committed to Jesus. All his finances were given to Jesus. All his desires were to please Jesus and to bring others to Jesus he committed himself to them. So I, I appreciate that personal exchange that he had. Not only was he just saying, okay, God, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And, and I don't know, but in this day and age, doesn't that seem to be kind of the spirit of this day and age? Is, I heard that they were giving out money for this COVID relief. Where's mine? Well, but you know, where's mine? I need some relief from this COVID thing too. You know, they go on down the list, all the things. How people are constantly giving, giving. And you ready for this? It's gotten so bad that there's so many jobs that need people to work for them. They can't get anybody to come to work because they can get more money staying at home and letting the government get to them. Folks, that was not God's design. God said by the sweat of our brow that we were to earn our bread. So as you look at all these things, I have committed unto him. So let me ask you this question. Are you committed to him? Have you committed yourself to him? Have you yielded yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ? And can he count on you? And I hope he can. And folks, I can tell you that you can always count on him, as I mentioned this morning. So we know all those things. There's a lot in that verse, and we'll, you know, we can preach a whole message from there. But here's another lot. You can know about separation. I know we started a little bit of a series on that Wednesday night talking about the importance of separation. But what I'm saying is that as a Christian, we need to separate ourselves from the world. We need to do things different than the world does it because we need to trust Jesus instead of the world system. And we need to be careful because uh, there's one thing to talk the world's language, but it's another thing to practice the world's practices. And as a Christian, we should not do that. It should be foreign to us. And we need to be willing to separate ourselves from the things of this world. And here's what it says in the scriptures in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17. It says, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. God makes it clear that we need to separate from the ways of the world and do things in a more heavenly way. That we need to separate ourselves from the world and do things like Jesus would do it instead of the way our neighbor would do it. Uh, wow. And then John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. And uh, as you look at these verses here, it says so much concerning separation that we need to be separate. And it's something that we, I'll put it this way, we know that we need to separate ourselves from the world. Uh, I was thinking a little bit earlier tonight and Somebody had brought a mixture of nuts to the domino table. Uh, we were playing what they call 42. And the person just made the statement and said, I know I need to get away from those things. I, 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 please eat them. And that was his way he said, I, I know I need to separate. I, I think his afraid he's going to go nuts from eating all those nuts. But anyway, <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that sometimes we know there's things that we need to separate from, even though we enjoy them. And it's not necessarily a sin, but sometimes there's certain things that keep us from God's best for us. And so as we look here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, listen what God says here. Love not the world. Love not the world. 
Now, when I say that, of course, I, I know and assume that you realize that God wants us to love the world to Jesus. He wants us to love the world to salvation. But he's saying, don't love the world system. Uh, neither the things that are in the world. Folks, are you ready for this? <laughs> You're not going to live here forever. Uh, as I look out among our crowd, we have quite a mixture. We have some that are quite young. We've got one that's, I guess it's just a little one month. That's pretty young, wouldn't you say? He's just an infant. And then we got some that are, well, I won't go there, okay? <laughs> but they're getting up in age. Uh, and so, it, it, it don't and here's the thing, we really don't know. Uh, even the youngest one among us is not exempt from death. And so what I'm saying is that death could come to us at any time. And so we need to be prepared. And again, as we look at the importance of separation, as it says here, this world, in one sense, they may reward you for being a hard worker or being faithful to your job and these other things. But we need to be careful and not focus on loving this world and the things of this world, but love the things of that world that's above us. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So again, folks, this is not our heaven. This is nowhere near heaven. As a Christian, this is the closest you and I will ever be to hell. For an unsaved person, this is the closest they'll ever be to heaven. Wow, that's scary. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Folks, that's what calls the first sin in this world was those three very things. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Simply what I'm saying, what we do for this world won't last very long. It'll be gone before you know it. And folks, you might say, well, I I've got $250,000 in the bank. Well, folks, that's probably worth almost 100000 now. <laughs> And, and before this year is out, it, it might be worth almost 25000 Maybe. Folks, uh, don't you wish I was exaggerating instead of that being a reality? But are you ready for this? The things that I've done for heaven, those that are in heaven, they're not fixing the, the rust or corrupt or, or be cast from heaven. They're going to be there forever and ever and ever. The rewards that I got waiting for me in heaven, they'll never be lost. So again, we need to love the right one. We need to love the heavenly world over the earthly world. And again, very, very important that we learn to separate ourselves from the things of this world. And, and there's several reasons for it. One thing is, uh, it's, this world will demand your time. And this world will do what it can to steal as much of your time from you. And what's sad is, I say still, but many times we willingly give to the world and we don't think anything about it. We go, well, I really enjoy this preacher. There's really not, not that bad about it. If it takes you away from God, it becomes an idol. It becomes a false God. And then we find that it's damaging to your testimony. And again, our testimony can either encourage people to go to heaven or discourage people from wanting to be with us in heaven. And then it's a downward trend. Have you ever noticed if you would talk to a billionaire and say, is there anything else that you want in life? And, and the majority would say, I, I just need a little more money. And you go, really? <laughs> Unbelievable, is it not? But what am I saying? It seemed like the world, the, the more it gets from you, the more you're gonna want from it. And that becomes dangerous. So again, uh, separation. You can know the importance of separation. God is going to bless you. Whatever you give up for the cause of Christ, God will replace it with much, much more. And then here's another law. And we've hit upon somewhat. You can know about the shadow of death. And it's interesting the fact that the Lord refers to death in that term as the shadow of death. Uh, if I were to ask you, any of you ever been hurt by a shadow? <laughs> You know, and somebody might say, well, I was doing some shadow boxing the other day, and you know. Uh, but if we talk about shadows, I mean, 
uh, I, I'll tell you, I enjoy when I'm out running and it's just really hot. I love running in the shadows. You know what I'm saying? In the shade of the trees and so forth. It's so much cooler there. It's amazing the difference it makes from being out in the direct sunlight. And uh, but what I'm trying to say is uh, the shadow isn't the real line. But the shadow is there because the real thing is there. And, and when I'm saying that death is real, but we are just facing the shadow of death right now. We're not, or low not fixing to die. But notice what it says in Hebrews 9, 27, and concerning the, the promise of death. It says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And folks, that's what we need to fear more than anything else. Uh, or excuse me, uh, let's call it the wrong verse. Uh, Hebrews 9, 27 says, and it's appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And so folks, we know again, that we're facing judgment and it comes after death. And so death is very real. And here's the thing, I'm trying right now to cancel a doctor's appointment that I have tomorrow because uh, we have Hannah and Joab and Jonathan are coming down to visit with us so they can get to see Daniel and see Connie and so forth. And, and then you'll see us and then see uh, little Amos over here and of course, uh, uh, Luke and Jonathan too. And so we're excited about that. And they're gonna come up, we're gonna meet in Kokomo. So we'll be kind of, you know, it's, it's not quite halfway for us, but that's okay. Uh, and so we'll meet in there, but I have a doctor's point. So I've got to, you know, counsel an appointment. But here's the thing, can you imagine me saying, God, I, well, God, I know you have an appointment set for my death, but I'd like to change it. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I would be probably saying, could I move it up? <laughs> you know, I'd probably say, uh, could I move it further out? You know, whatever. Uh, but what I'm saying is, uh, uh, I, I can't change that appointment. It's been set. And I guarantee you, when you find yourself in the presence of the Lord, the Lord's not going to say, what are you doing here? You're too early. <laughs> <laughs> or God would say, you're a little late. <laughs> God would say, you're right on time. We'll make that appointment right on time. This is God has scheduled it for us. And so again, we see the shadow of death that it's certain that we're going to die. Death is so certain. And again, I know some will say, well, preach, I'm looking forward to the rapture and I am too. And uh, that would be so fantastic. But then we see the powerlessness of death in 1 Corinthians 15, 54. And as we look at it, it says, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Folks, I don't know, can y'all picture this? We die and we go to heaven and we get heaven. I can't believe I'm in heaven. <laughs> Man, it's terrible. I had to die to get here. Uh, wow, there's my dad, there's my uncle, there's my, there's Uncle Michael there, there's my, my brother Mike, there's, you know, and, and uh, there's Mamo, huh? You know, and um, there's Jesus right there. Oh, this is so, folks, you know what it says? Death is swallowed up in victory. I mean, we're going to be so busy shouting and enjoying the, wow, you look great, you look fantastic, you look so heavenly. And maybe I'll hear him say something like this. Jerry, you really lost some weight. <laughs> I don't know. But what I'm going to say is that it's going to be a perfect reunion. And I, I can't help but think first thing to say, hey, uh, we're going to have dinner at Jesus' house today. <laughs> yeah. But we talk about, we have a victory dinner. I mean, victory. Victory. Can you imagine? Man, he died. Isn't that terrible? Isn't that sad? <laughs> and, and if it's a Christian, you know, Wow, what a victory. I appreciated uh, Michael's funeral uh, because it was so positive. We watched it uh, uh, on YouTube and we got to watch it as it was happening. But it was so very, very positive, his services, uh, as we heard the three pastors speak concerning him. And uh, what a blessing. And, but what I'm saying, the shadow of death is really real. Death could come to us at any time. We don't know. Uh, and, and again, we need to get ready. Now is the time to get ready for death. The position after death, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 and 8, it says this, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, referring to our body, were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Verse 8, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wow. Isn't that fantastic? 
Isn't that fantastic promise that we have? Isn't it nice that we can know we're going to have a better body? Right now, I'm limping around. And uh, my tendency to want to kind of run around a little bit, but my knee is not uh, in the best of shape right now. And every time I get up, it hurts. It, it really hurts. And I hate to say this is what hurts. It makes me feel like I'm an old man. <laughs> that hurts my pride here. I've always, uh, in fact, my doctor said, uh, the last time I saw my doctor, he said, uh, I want you to know we really admire you around here. I said, you know, dude? He said, we don't have any men over 70 years of age that are running four miles a, a day, let alone the time you're doing it in. We don't have, and he just started naming all these things. And, and uh, I was pretty impressed with myself too when he got through telling me all these things. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm sorry. <laughs> I strayed, but back to where we were, the shadow of death. Folks, I'm looking forward to heaven. Are you looking forward to heaven? And we're not going to be just floating around in the clouds, if you please. It's going to be so different from what we ever imagined. In fact, you ever seen the uh, golden streets in heaven? I mean, in the clouds? No, I don't think you have. Okay, all that said, last thought as we finish our message tonight. You can know about the second coming. And folks, I am looking forward to the second coming of Christ. I'm so thankful for his first coming, aren't you? And as I think of that second coming, uh, I think in, in Job, I think of all things, you think Job has something about the second coming of Christ? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. that. In Job chapter 19, listen to what God says. And remember the, the Bible was had one author, that was God. Of course, he used others to, to print his word that he shared with them, like a uh, boss shared with the secretary or whatever. But notice what it says here in Job chapter 19 concerning our resurrection. And it's really graphic, the picture here, okay? Here's what it says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth. Okay, here's Job, about 2,000 years before Jesus came. And he says, I know that my Redeemer's alive right now. But he had not even been born yet. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I know that he liveth, my Redeemer liveth. As Job shares as he goes on, Job says this, and that he shall stand on the latter day upon the earth. And I know the day is coming that my Redeemer is going to stand upon the earth. He's going to stand before all the world and all the world's going to see him. And then Job goes on and he says this, and again, to the inspiration of God, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, ooh, that sounds a little gruesome, I mean, I'm not looking forward to worms eating my body or you. <laughs> kind of gruesome. Even after my skin, worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. <laughs> so it goes on. And that even though my body's going to be completely destroyed and eaten by worms, I will see him in my flesh. Wow. <laughs> Talk about body resurrection being reunited our soul or spirit together in this body and saying so well i'm gonna have my body cremated okay uh god has no problem with that remember the first man was created by mud the first woman was created by a spare rib <laughs> you know, i mean wow god don't have any problem putting this back together uh it's not a problem for him it would be for you and me but yet in my flesh shall i see god verse 27 whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall be whole and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Even though it be totally nothing but dust left of us, or ashes, or whatever the case might be, no matter what happens, we'll see him completely. And, and this year, I think the reference will, we'll be able to hug him, he'll be able to hug us because we're going to be so real. We're going to be as real as Jesus is. How exciting! when we think of the Lord's second coming. Again, our resemblance in 1 John 3, 2. It says this to make it a little bit clearer about the resurrection. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. In other words, it's just really hard to imagine us in such a, I don't know if you want to use the word, angelic type body, in, in such a body of perfection. And I, I look out here, and folks, I'm not trying to insult anybody, but I'm not seeing a whole lot of perfection out here. You know what I'm saying? 
And when I look in the mirror, uh, I go, oh man, when did I get that new zit? You know, or when did that happen? Who pulled my hair out while I was sleeping? What happened to it? You know, and I look in and go, man, what? A, you know, and, and I see all these imperfections. And, and you don't see it in the mirror either? Okay, well, moving along. But what I'm saying, wow. Here's what I'm saying. It does not yet appear what we're going to look like. You ready for this? When we see the folks in heaven, it's like this morning, uh, one of the ladies in our church that's known Daniel for, uh, I guess, for 20 years, something like that. And she just looked at him and she said, uh, uh, I don't think I know you or something. I don't know what the conversation went like, but it was something like that. Uh, and then suddenly when she realized it, went, oh, you're Daniel. You, know? <laughs> you ready for this? We're not going to get that and go, uh, Oh, you're my dad. How are you, dad? <laughs> you ready? You're going to know everybody in heaven. Isn't that something? Somebody, can you imagine your brain having that power? <laughs> to know everybody in heaven? Not to see a stranger? And everybody knows you? Wow. But it says that we won't know, there's so many things that we won't understand about this appearance, but we know it's going to happen. And he goes on and he says this, um, as we look on, Beloved, now are ye the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Folks, how many times have I preached that here? Folks, we need to be more like Jesus. Be more like Jesus. Folks, you ready? We're going to be exactly like Jesus. <laughs> so, and, 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 I don't know if it'll grow old or not, so maybe we might be Jesus when we get to heaven. But anyhow, as we look at the resemblance, and he says, for we shall see him as he is. Wow. See him for what he is. Philippians 3.20 and verse 21 also. For our conversation, our life is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the work and word by, he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Simply look at it this way. For us to achieve perfection in our body here, it's impossible. It's never going to happen. I don't care how far science may advance. I don't care what to take. It's never going to reach a place where we'll say, well, we're all perfect now because they found this perfect medication for us. That's not going to happen. But in heaven, it's going to. And I like the way it emphasizes because Jesus is perfect. And perfection is what he does. He, he makes perfection. And we will be perfect like he is when we get to heaven. We'll have his glory. Wow, isn't that exciting? People will see us like they see Jesus in a state of perfection. And what a, a glorious thing to look forward to when that happens. And again, it says he said, dude, all things, you ready? There won't be any more death in heaven. There won't be any more old age in heaven. There won't be any death until I don't worry about, man, anybody see my hearing aids? Anybody see my glasses? Anybody see, you know, cool time is. All the things that uh, we lose, that's not going to happen. And then the last thought concerning of what you can know about the second coming. Our reunion. We've enjoyed reuniting with Daniel. And we've enjoyed reuniting with uh, Connie for this bit. And of course we've enjoyed the last almost three years of reuniting with Levi and his family. And uh, watching his family grow before our eyes. <laughs> I guess it's almost double since you've been here, hasn't it? Uh, but, but anyhow, that's, that's exciting. I mean, it's exciting. Me and the church has got to enjoy that too. And, and uh, I feel like my, my grandsons have so many grandparents out here, you know, and, and uh, cousins and siblings out here too among the, the church crowd. But what I'm trying to say is there will be a reunion. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says it this way. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Wow. Isn't that fantastic? I mean, just think of all that's involved just in that short verse. we got a lot to look forward to. And the thing is, you ready? You can know this is the truth, not because I preached it, but because it's God's word. 
Isn't that fantastic? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm I may not getting too excited over my own message, but uh, I enjoy looking at the scriptures and seeing what we have to look forward to. Aren't you thankful for God's certainties? Folks, I'm not sharing a fairy tale with you. In fact, I can't think of a fairy tale that comes even close to what we're sharing with you tonight. Fairy tales, I, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but they're not real. But what I shared with you tonight is real. And we truly can trust God. Maybe the surest thing I need to get across tonight is you are loved. God loves you. And God didn't just say, I love you. And that would have been sufficient if God just said, I love you. But God proved it over and over and over again that he loved us. And then when he, he became human flesh, became creation, his own creation, and went through, wow, being a baby. Uh, uh, we've had babies around our house. Uh, uh, we've gone through three different sets of diapers now. And thank the Lord, Jonathan's finally out of the diapers. And, uh, but anyhow, uh, and so, I mean, he had his diapers, and then, of course, Luke is still in his diapers, and then, of all things, we still haven't gotten uh, Amos potty trained. Of course, he's a month old, but, but what I'm saying is <sighs> there's a common statement that happens in our house all the time. Uh, 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 my tendency to say, hey, Jen, uh, Luke is a little ripe here. <laughs> You know, but what I'm saying is, Jesus went through all that for us. He was God. Folks, how dare somebody think that God did not love us? He was willing to go through the humbleness, if you please, of being a baby. Couldn't get up and walk on his own, even though he was able to heal the lame. He wasn't able to put his hair in place, if you please, even though he could get a person's sight to do those things for himself. He wasn't able to speak, even though he was able to cause the dumb to speak when he came in as a baby. Wow. God loves you. God loves you so much. And I've shared this before, but I believe if you had been the only sinner born into this world, I think that he would have come and died for you. Isn't that amazing? What I'm saying, he loves you personally. Beyond our wildest imagination, his great love he has for you. So, I know I'm loved. And how dare you get in a pity party and go, well, nobody loves me, nobody cares about me. <laughs> shame on you. Don't want to shake that hand when you leave. <laughs> Folks, God bless you. And there's nothing more that he could have done to prove than what he did. Wow. Would you stand to your feet as we begin our invitation? Lord, thank you for this time we can come together and study your word. And thank you for the certainties that you've given us in this life, the life that's coming. Lord, thank you for, for loving us when we deserve your wrath. We deserve your judgment. We deserve your punishment. But instead, you, you shared your love. And you've done all you can other than just taking us completely over and turning us into puppets or whatever. You did all that you could to cause us to accept you and your plan. Lord, help us see that our plan will send us to hell, will send us to an eternity without you. How frightening that is. But your plan will... Send us to a place of joy beyond our wildest imaginations. Well, send us to a place where there's no more death, where there's no more sorrow, where there's no more pain, where there's no more forgetfulness, where there's no more blemishes, so there's no more surgeries, and we can go on down the list, all the things. Lord, thank you for a no-soul religion. Thank you, Lord, that we can know where we're going when we step out of this life. We pray now if there's a man or a woman or a boy or a girl that has never received you, that they might pray this simple childlike prayer and say, Dear God, please forgive me 
of all my sins and come into my heart and become my Lord and my Savior. May they pray that in faith. We ask this in your son's precious name. Amen. You know where you're going when you die? Good. Martha said this morning that she was dealing with those seven people and she had to Christ this morning. She said, Dad, it was so easy because the message was so clear on how to get saved. She said, All I had to do is remind them of the things that you said in the sermon. She said, It just worked out so good. And she went ahead and she said this. I don't hear this too often from my wife. And she said, that sermon was just perfect this morning. <laughs> wow. It's my head getting big. <laughs> but folks, it wasn't me. It was God speaking through me. Isn't it fantastic? We'll see him take over. Our tendency is to fumble, mess things up. But we submit to Jesus. Wonderful things happen. <laughs> so we want to go ahead and dismiss some prayer and I, I don't get to call Caleb a whole lot so I'll call him Caleb right now Caleb would you dismiss us Heavenly Father we thank you for the services tonight Lord for everyone that made the effort to be here I'll be with those that were out today 